Okay. Thank you very much for having me today here. It's uh, a great pleasure and also an honor uh, to be here uh, celebrating a fellow day. I'm going to start by bringing best wishes and many thanks from two groups of people. First, the Development Economics Research Group at the University of Copenhagen, a group of people who are indebted to you, Pierre. And also best wishes and many thanks from you and your wider in uh, Helsinki. We have over the past few years, under your leadership, uh, been implementing the political economy of food price policy project. And I don't know whether you have noticed, but I mean, it says PPPA, Professor Pierre Pinstrup Anderson, and then it says PE, but then F, and then PPP again. We refer to that as Pierre's professional power. It's not purchasing power parity, it's Pierce professional power. <laughs> now, in this book that is going to come out shortly, um, I checked just before I came up here, and basically the contract is just to be about signed, and when the, when the manuscript was submitted, the delegates of OUP, they enthusiastically <coughs> approved the project. Now, so you're gonna have 15 country case studies to uncover the political economy factors that explain variations in policy responses across countries in times of increased food price volatility. Pierre has been adamant in insisting that we are entering a period of increased price volatility. We agree with that, and you have something to look forward to. Now, the background for the present paper that I'm going to present here is the global food and fuel price spike in 2008. And yes, it was indeed a spike, but do take note of the underlying trend, at least in this period. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Now, this crisis very quickly caught the headlines of many newspapers. The World Bank Chief Economist for Africa, he was having a blog running, and he also made a series of presentations in various places talking about hundreds of thousands of excess deaths. UNICEF and WFP and its national press, they basically shouted red alert. And most of us who sort of work in this area, we were called up by newspapers who wanted us to make statements about this international crisis. So what happened in practice? In reality, in developing countries, did price increases get transmitted to consumers and producers? If so, how and by how much? Did governments intervene? If so, how? And were interventions effective? Who gained, who lost? And what was the impact on the poor? I'm, I'm not gonna try to, to sort of respond to that globally. Pierre would be much better at doing that. But I am hoping that in Pierre's spirit that I can try and concentrate on one country, Vietnam, which is a particular country that I happen to know reasonably well. It's going through a very dynamic experience and has a particular social and economic and political history. And I'm going to concentrate on one crop, rice, which continues to play a critical role in this economy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about net producers, net consumers, and non-producers. I won't have time, or rather, it's so late, that what I have prepared in terms of talking about the literature review, I'd better try to just sort of skip and just mention the key words here, because most of you in this audience will be pretty well read on issues of price transmission, price incentives, supp supply response of producers, and welfare impact of price changes on consumers, but this is at the very core of what this is all about. And of course, we do have variations over these themes, some of us do agree in terms of exactly where we put the emphasis, um, but I'll sort of just basically skip that now, except for maybe drawing attention to this sort of distinction between net consumers and net producers is absolutely critical. Now, some of the more sort of academic assessments of the crisis that came in relatively early, they were somewhat more moderated than the international press and the World Bank chief economist for Africa, we had certainly dropped down to a somewhat smaller number of potential excess deaths. There was a special issue of agricultural economics that kind of 
sort of recognize that, well, there are variations over the theme, but effects were largely seen as very negative. Um, and and uh, I'm sort of interested in, in that. Now, why are some countries better able to define and implement policies? Well, that's going to be the topic of the book the peer is editing and which is coming out shortly. Now, country background. Well, Vietnam, mid-1970s, collective mode of production. Um, Bengali was somewhere here, but he did a paper in 92 with a Vietnamese colleague, and uh, they pointed out, you're there, sorry, Prabhu, um, pointed out that uh, rice production was very low, productivity was even falling, Vietnam was a, nice, uh, was a rice importer, and a critical stable. So then the reform process got underway. The Vietnamese did put on their thinking cap. They took bold initiatives. The Doi Moi reforms got underway, and a series of decentralization initiatives were taken. Individual property rights got back into action. Interestingly, the tenure certificates are called red books. So sort of interesting, we spoke about capitalism and so on. So in Vietnam, this sort of capitalist instrument is called a red book. But land use is controlled. So when people like David Dollar says that the Vietnamese experience is one of total liberalization, more than one third of agricultural land, you must grow rice. It's in your tenure certificate. So this is not just a case of total liberalization. And you follow this according to annual production plans, centrally fixed, goes all the way up and down, and there's even an export plan as well. Government continues to intervene very significantly, but Vietnam did become the second largest rice exporter in the world within a few years, and it retains this position to date. Now just to sort of summarize, so sort of 24, 25 years after the introduction of the more reforms, Households do sell their production output to private buyers, trade land and sell labor on the private market. But the state retains a hugely important role in economic life. The state intervenes actively in the land rental market, supplies many inputs, strongly dominates formal markets for financial services, and plays a key role in a large number of local organizational institutions and activities. And, as I mentioned, intervenes heavily in actual use of the land, in farmers' choice of crops. So that's an interesting context, I think, sort of at least interesting to think about uh, what happened with this 2008 food price spike. Now, we're fortunate in the case of Vietnam that we have two sets of data. One is sort of the uh, regular LSMS-type data that you know from a variety of countries. Now, you can use those to identify net rice producers and consumers. And they can also be used to compute average household purchase price and sale prices at both regional and quintile levels. That's sort of one piece of information that's quite important if you actually want to grapple with what happens when these price changes take place. But then on the other hand, we're having a specialized rural household survey, which the University of Copenhagen, together with a number of Vietnamese partners, have been implemented since 2002. And we've had about 3,000, but in the panel that I'm going to use here, uh, we've used about 2,080 households surveyed in 2006, 8, 10, and 12. And this survey makes it possible for us to analyze production and sales response as well as providing some contextual information. So by matching these two data sets, we're actually having an unusually rich insight into what actually happened. Now, if you look at these uh, producer and retail prices, you can see that uh, they're not quite as excessive as the first one I showed you. And when we actually go into the data sets, we find that the trends were much more smooth than that even these figures show. So in other words, both the producer price and the retail price were smoothing out even more. 
Now, this one is obviously difficult to read. And um, I have to admit that um, I was pondering a bit about how I should do this. But still, let me see. Can I get it? Yeah. So here, most farmers produce rice. Who produce rice? In particular, the poor. Where? In particular, in the north. OK? Now, <clears throat> most farmers are actually net producers. A very small minority are net consumers. So in such a situation, one would actually kind of predict that lots of farmers should benefit. If prices go up, well, you know, then these claims for major crisis should not really be expected. We can also see that the net consumers are obviously the poorest. If you sort of look up here, you can kind of get this sense that, oh, lowest here, this one is, I'm having a hard time. Net consumers, you can see how these numbers follow exactly as you would kind of expect. But we take these numbers from actual survey data. And then when you go down here to the bottom, try and look at this number. So net consumers 2.9, it actually increases to 3.5 in 2008, and then drops back again in 2010. Sort of more or less what we would expect, right? Price spike. So the numbers were net consumer, the share that is net consumers go up. So much for that one. This figure here shows what? Well, the first observation you can sort of take is that net consuming producers, net producers, and non producers. Well, you see the rural-urban distinction very clearly. Who are the poorest? The net producing rural. Who are the next poorest? Net producers rural. And who are the richest? Well, the non-producers mainly urban. Comes out very clearly from these numbers, which again are from the actual survey data. There are some people among the non-producers who are poor but that's not a very big number. You can also see that the gap between the net producers and net consumers actually widens as you go from 2006 to 2008. If you compare these numbers, you can see that actually that gap does sort of open up, which is, again, what we would sort of expect. So. What happened in terms of production response? Again here, these are the actual responses surveyed in the data where we have data down to the plot level. This is not just some sort of average pulled out of something. It's actually going out to each household, identifying how many plots they have, what's actually being produced on that plot, average five plots, and so on and so forth. And I can talk a lot about that. But we are actually having relatively interesting data here. So what we can see is that prices, average sales prices, yes, I can't get this one to work, sorry. They do increase. That was the trend I referred to before. The share that's growing rice well, going up, right? So this means it's going down. So from 6 to 8 to 10 to 12, there's a gradual decline of rice producers, more or less in line with what you would sort of expect in a developing economy, a country that is actually moving forward. The average output goes up. And try and see what happens on the selling side. So 2008 percent selling jumps very considerably and then falls back, stabilizes around 40%. See what happens 
to the ones who use improved seed. Wow, here they sort of realized that there might be something in this here, so there was this increase, but then it fell a bit back again. Now, then you may say, well, did government do nothing? Well, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But there's something here which I really want to draw your attention to. Try to see what happened with the ones who were subject to crop restrictions. And what this means in this case is, do you have to grow rice on that plot? And it's down to each and individual plot we have in our sample. Well, back in 2006, quite a lot. Then the plan sort of was kind of loosened, so it fell down to 40%. I'm going to come back to that observation that it fell down. But then note what happens here. What happens is that because this year was so good, because of the output responses that seem to be happening, the authorities became pretty lax. They thought that, okay, fine. But then they got worried again, and then they pushed it back up. So they are operating in the back, and these restrictions are effectively being put on. It's not just something that happens sort of coincidentally or randomly or something like that. It happens pretty controlled. So what are the conclusions here? And I'm hoping I'm making your job a bit easier, Chair. Net producers, well, that's the very large majority of rice producers in, in Vietnam. And they clearly benefited. They increased their production levels. And what's the impact? Well, the impact is a sizable downwards impact on the poverty rate. But quite, quite a large number of these net producing farmers were poor in 2006, but got out of poverty. They moved above the poverty line. What about the non-producing households? Well, yes, they did lose out, but who are they? Well, they're the better off urbans. There's a small minority, and I don't want to just sort of discount that, but they are generally better off and above the poverty line already in 2006. So what did their loss, what did that mean to the poverty rate? Nothing. Because none of them really fell below the poverty line. The net consuming producers, they obviously also lost out. They mostly live in the Northwest, are poor, and they are ethnic minorities, already poor. So what happened to them is not really caught by the poverty line, because quite a few of them are already below the poverty line. So their poverty deepened, but it's not caught in the national poverty numbers. This is actually confirmed in some other work that I've been doing with Andy where we have tried to look at three measures of welfare. And in this generally sort of seen as a rather successful Vietnamese experience, how many of our 3,000 households that we've surveyed do you think got materially worse off by more than 20% over this six year period from 2006 to 12? 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, a quarter. It's kind of interesting to think about. At least I think so. 16% got more than 20% worse off by these three welfare indicators in this very successful. So if somebody says that development is always pretty, it's not always pretty. It's associated with transformations, changes, moving up and down. I don't know whether I should say capitalism is not pretty, but, um, but, but, but these changes are going on. And I would submit that the only way we can really get to grips with this 
is by having these panel type series of data, because that's the only way in which we really can get a hold on these issues. Now, what did government do? Well, Vietnam is a rice exporter. They actually reduced their export quota, and they even imposed an export ban, motivated on the one hand by food security, because of the historical background. Obviously, the Vietnamese are very concerned about food security. And in addition to that, there was a sort of a poor harvest looming the year before, and the national planning system kind of sent signals up, hey, wait a second, we, we are running out of store, uh, uh, ricin from our stores and so on. And then there was, in addition, the stabilization need. So the central authorities decided, OK, we're going to put on a ban. Now, that, of course, caused widespread discussion, both internationally as well as domestically, saying these Vietnamese authorities are stupid, crazy. Don't they realize that they are losing out? Can they see that they are disturbing the international <coughs> markets? And some of the producers, obviously, were concerned because they could see that, well, there might be a possibility out there for capturing profits, extraordinary profits. But as a matter of fact, the authorities at the same time alleviated the price impact by granting exception from taxes on, for, on both consumers, the VAT, and on producers. So that's the corporate income tax and others. And very shortly after, they exempted producers from land taxes and increased extension support and credit. And then again, very shortly after, they started up a major, really big stimulus package for agriculture and rural development. Now, when you look at all this, it looks pretty messy. And Pierre, we've been discussing it quite a lot, what actually happened and what was actually the impact. And you've been pushing me on a number of occasions. I hope at least I've sort of tried to suggest that maybe what looked like sort of rather messy, intransparent, not necessarily very consistent. Actually, when you look at the effect, it was very consistent. Because what it did is it managed to smoothen the price impact. It did not change the trends, neither for producers nor for consumers, but it smoothened the impact. It maintained a stable increase in producer incentives, and it did ensure that consumers were not hit excessively. So I would argue that this is at least one case where it does seem to sort of work somehow. It hasn't been always very transparent. I've spent a long time trying to figure out behind the scene what went on and interviewing people and sort of to, to really try to understand what motivated what, when, and how. The one thing that I would add, and I haven't presented all the numbers and the shares and so on, but what Vietnam still does face is a challenge with the ethnic minorities. They are the ones who are right now not, how can you say, being on the wagon that's moving pretty fast. And they are the, exactly the people I referred to as the net consumers, the ones who are in the Northwest, and the ones who, if they are in urban areas, tend to be at the very bottom. It's a tricky issue, but that's what I, I would argue is the one sort of core element of what the Vietnamese have not managed to tackle as yet. Thank you, Chair.